Dear Mirwise, A few months ago, I wrote a letter to you entailing all my fears, hopes, and aspirations about Kashmir. I also wrote at the end that I waited your reply. When I received none, I could only assume you had not received my post, so I decided that perhaps a vile message would be best. So here again is my letter to you. Dear Sir, I cannot pretend to be well informed in regards to the political turmoil of Kashmir, nor can I assume to know what's best for the nation as a whole. These I leave to better experienced individuals, but that does not mean I will not give my two cents as to how the future may turn out, because invariably, I will be very much a part of it. The little I know about you has been provided to me by various media outlets, websites, and general gossip. Overall, you're said to be the progressive voice, the leader of the youth revolt, and a beacon for the next generation. But sometimes I wonder, do you yourself believe that? Have you faith in yourself to emanate such a message? Please don't think ill of me, I'm simply expressing my concerns. I bid you read on and understand my qualms. You've stated that these freedom movements require resources and money, and that others simply attempt to portray it as a commercial activity. But my good sir, I would have to disagree with you on one major point, that there is no attempt to defame the freedom movement or to label it as a monetary scheme. It's an established fact. Defamation need not arise from questions about the money trail, when meaningless quarrels do enough on their own. Ideology no doubt will differ, but such unrest amongst our so-called leaders does nothing to quell the vociferous masses who entrust their hopes and dreams to the cause. Do you see the light in their eyes as you speak? How they follow your every word and pray for you with all their hearts. And as for the matter of funds, just how much do you require? What is the cost of freedom these days? No doubt money is needed, hundreds of thousands of rupees at the very least, but even the smallest amount given can go far enough and reach the intended goal when utilized appropriately. I can only imagine the funding your and other political organizations in Kashmir receive. To what use is it put? India is still indifferent? The world still unaware? Where does it all go? You are a religious leader and hold a degree in Islamic studies. How do you use it to your advantage? Your sermons speak of the chance of freedom, of those who have died, and what we have to live for. But why do you not mention associated necessities such as the importance of education, that tit for tat does nothing but end lives that have hardly begun, for the youth to think with open minds, to be accepting of the world around them, and to bring about change through enlightenment? My generation is boiling over with distrust, distrust of our leaders, our neighbors, our protectors, and our teachers. Since we've been children, we've felt the sting of retribution in its many forms. This distrust fuels our anger, leads to us lashing out violently, taking to the streets in retaliation, and becoming the latest obituary. At organized processions, you lead perched atop a throne of swords, flanked by minions, and offer a wave to your followers. Walk amongst us, feel our pain, and understand our problems. Be not like a stern ruler looking down upon his subjects. I had a chance to observe you and Mr. Malik proceed out of Jamia Masjid on Jumat al last year. The two of you sat next to each other, but seemed uncomfortable, as though feigning reconciliation, while a man on the same motorcade shouted slogans through a bullhorn and added to the chaos. As you all came closer to the reporters, you seemed to point out this very fact to Mr. Malik and offer your hand in a rehearsed manner, just for the cameras. Is this all a publicity stunt? How am I to believe that you work for the same end as I do? Perhaps at one time you did. It is evident now you don't. Thrust into the spotlight at a young age, I could hardly understand the weight that must have fallen upon your shoulders. But time has passed, and maybe it is my folly, but I would think as a grown man you would have a mind of your own at this point. Again, take no offense to my words. I've often been chastised for being too straightforward, but I see no reason to beat around the bush. You've surrounded yourself with voices that mandate and regulate your every move, from what you wear, to where you go, to what you say, and how you say it. If you yourself are not a free man, how can you expect your country to be so? The valley is chock full of political parties, and all are spewing the same nonsense in different disguises. 
We keep chasing our tails, and those who should have led us straight are reaping in their benefits from our toil and trade. The fact of the matter is, these factions, these inter-party fights, the facades of reconciliation can only go on for so long. Like it or not, at some point the general public will catch on. Naturally, the toppling of one bobbling head will quickly be replaced by another, just as self-serving, whose strings are pulled according to the whims of an unseen force. And where does that leave the starving public, hungry for justice? Many a family caught amidst the volatile atmosphere that they once called home are trapped with the onslaughts of curfews that are declared. You see, not everyone has a fixed income. Have you seen the father, tired and worn, who comes home to children just as ragged? The mother who sacrifices her portion so that her family stays fed? How can you feel their pain when you live not amongst them? Medical treatment can't be offered if the roads are shut down. How many must die of curable ailments before anyone cares? The heads talk of a UN involvement, but to what end? Who is it that comes out with elans to close up shop? These strikes continue, children stay out of school, wallets remain empty, and stomachs rumble with anger. Do you expect that we, the leaders of tomorrow, will stay by your side? Give us a reason to do so. We've seen our parents suffer, buried our friends, and taken our lashings, and no more shall we be subjugated by our own. The shackles of India are easy to break. They fall off like putty in our hands. But the choking hold of our withered land and its corrupt heads suffocate our resolve to succeed. To be free of it, we leave en masse to greener lands, and think not of our former heaven except to cluck our tongues and ask for God's help. These thoughts before you are but a few of the many that plague me. The reality is our nation is full of potholes that crater into sinkholes and all everybody ever does is talk. Well, I'm sick of that. I want reform. I want progress. I want freedom. But I don't ever see that happening. Not with the way things are. And point no fingers at our oppressors on the aspects of Azadi when you and I know very well that they have little to do with the more pressing issues that keep us bound. Freedom is fickle, and something no one can keep us from so long as we are educated. But that is the one thing we inherently lack. So here before you is the manifesto of today's youth. How will you respond to it? I earnestly await a reply from your end, and a sincere one at that, nothing factory produced or watered down. Give me my worth in words, for gone are the days of naivety. Regards, Breeze Jaws.